可以说，教你说不干活。Uh, one, one thing that, that has always uh, not confused me, but slowed down going between different fields is the uh, conflicting terminology or jargon that, that, that pops up. And I'm, I'm still not very good at it, uh, but I think I'm, I'm making some, some sort of progress. For example, I, I think I've learned that, that learning is estimation, right? The words, the words mean different things. I think I, I sort of understand how what a um, uh, test data set is and what a training data set is. But uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to go, go back and forth between some, some of the jargons. This, this, this uh, title means that <clears throat> as a statistician, I want to evaluate things. I do through, basically, I'll, I'll describe everything here as if it's being done by simulation. I think that that's what people eventually do. Uh, anyway, with comparing procedures. Uh, oh, one other thing I, I, I want to check is, according to the schedule, I finished uh, 25 minutes ago. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 could, I could finish early and just walk out. But, uh, so then what, what should I do? Uh, how much time do I have? Seven minutes. What? You're feeling tough. You're feeling tough. I think I'll be dead by then. <laughs> okay, I, I will, I'll, I'll try to keep it to uh, uh, roughly a half hour or less. Short of your time. So, <clears throat> but this talk is, is about is statistical evaluations for comparing procedures for analyzing data. And uh, there, there's a word relevant in there because I, I really think that, that what, uh, how you compare, how you evaluate competing procedures really depends a lot on, on loss functions. And, and I don't think so, so much uh, formal statistical uh, loss functions because, in fact, when people make decisions, the, the world is often changing very rapidly. So the, uh, for example, I've, over the last 50 years, I've done a, a bunch of consulting for uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration. And, and they're, they're not as crazy as they sometimes seem for, for press releases. Uh, because the, when, when you're proving uh, a new proposed drug, some sponsors of, of a new drug, a lot of the context depends on what else is available to treat the condition. And, and they're aware of that. And if, if there's nothing else to, to treat the, the condition, they can even, uh, if it's a rare condition, they've been, they've been known to approve drugs based on, on, on no randomized trials at all, even though they, they usually prefer randomized trials. So if, if there's nothing else available and it has to treat something, uh, you know, companies make billions of dollars on drugs like that. In fact, there are probably three or four companies in, in Cambridge that, that, that have done that. So uh, I, I, but I do think that the evaluation has to uh, take into account loss functions, but they're not, they're not the usual loss functions. In fact, I'll try to be clear about that. Uh, so, Principal data analyst. This is really my view. But you know, by principal, I don't mean correct. I don't mean that they're doing the right thing. I mean, they just are following principles. And in fact, people who follow principles often are doing things that are pretty stupid. But they have principles to <laughs> follow them. And, and most people who, who are principal often don't make the uh, correct decisions. So there are, there's, there are several names that, that, that pop up here. Uh, first one is Naaman, the Jersey Naaman for Naaman Pearson, which is basically how most people think about statistics. Repeated sampling, they have a, they have a hypothetical distribution, take many draws from it, and you derive uh, properties of it. And so there's this one, one property called about calibration of procedures. And the easiest one to think about really is an interval estimate. So if I, if I have an interval, a, a method for creating an interval estimate, in repeated sampling, and I'll, I'll go over this in a little bit more detail later. In repeated sampling, there was a 95% interval among all ge samples generated. No matter what the truth is, this interval should cover 95%. That, that's, what, that's what Naaman said. He first did this about 1923, and, and he, did, he defined the phrase confidence interval in 1934. It's, it's kind of a stupid definition. Because 
The real line is a 95% confidence interval. The whole real line. Because it covers the, the unknown parameter at least 95% of the time. So it's, it's also a 10% confidence interval. It's also 1% confidence interval. It's also 99% confidence interval. Well, how does that do? It doesn't do, do, do much good. So you have to bring some other principle to in order to control whether it, it's a valid confidence interval. Bayesians, well, they care about proper conditioning on observed data. See, same thing, you derive a posterior distribution given the observed data, and it's a particular specification. Here's the model. And you basically have to believe the model. And even if the model is, is a mixture model, you, you try to do uh, model selection, you can condition on one of the models be considered as being true. So what's wrong with that? Well, let's say something that's the bottom of that. This is fiducial, this is Fisher now, so Bayes died a long time ago. Uh, Naaman died about 20 years ago, I guess, or 15. Uh, Fisher died about 20 years ago as well. Uh, and he had this idea of, of fiducial, which no one has made to work right. Yeah. But again, there's an, an essential idea there that I think is very important, which is you avoid a shoe accepting models that are contradicted by the observed data. It's a very consistent with the, with the, with the barbarian view of, of science. You, you can't prove any, any empirical model is right. What you can do is prove things are inconsistent with the data. So you go, you know, he has this great quote, which is something like, uh, science begins with the uh, disproving of myths. But any hypothetical truth is wrong. There's a myth. If you propose a myth, and then you go on, and then you find it's wrong. In Newtonian physics, it's a myth. Prove it's wrong. And uh, do people still believe that the current view of, of, of string theory won't be considered a myth and wrong in another 150 years? I have no idea, but I, but I, I have to. I remember it, 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 at Harvard, in the early days of talking with uh, I Andy Gleason? Gleason, you know the, the yeah, math guy? Was, uh, of course, he won't understand it. No, but he believes that what we now know about, about physics will be true in a thousand years. The world of understanding won't change. We now understand everything. I'm, I'm sure if, that, if, sure if you were alive now, you'd not realize that's probably not true. Well, it's true in a right scale. In, in, in a gross scale. Yeah, we scale. Yeah. Um, and to be valid, really most statisticians mean they appears to be valid. Confidence you must have the right coverage, at least at least the right coverage. Tests reject at the obvious rate or, or less often two two null hypotheses. And that's what validity sort of has, has come to mean. You see it's, it's sort of hard to define validity to a to a Bayesian example. But, um, so to be valid, statisticians would have to be name and Pearson calibrated. I think that's what most people now accept. I'm not saying it's, it's true that, or that's the only definition of validity, but I think it's the currently accepted definition. And, and what, I, what, I, what I want to try to do is relate that uh, to what machine learners do when they do simulations to try to select procedures. That one procedure is better than the other procedure. Sage data analyst means somebody who's wise, sage, wise, sagacious, but confronted with an actual data set are more conditional on, on the actual data set, Y star. So Y star, sorry for instance, something's actually observed. So the idea here is, okay, you're gonna, you want name and calibration, for example, for an interval, so it has the right coverage, averaging over. We're looking at all, all these different data sets, but now looking at a data set, and what changes? Well, you know, Naaman and, and Fisher were the, the, the two you know, founders of, of modern statistics. That, that, there's a really nice book about that, by Eric Lehman. Um, and they, they, they never really agreed very much about anything, but also they, they, uh, Fisher really hated Naaman, which didn't help. Uh, but, it, but Fisher was much more, in this fiducial sense, wanted to condition on the observed data. It was very Bayesian in, in, in his thinking. And Naaman, actually, if you look back at the original definition of confidence interval, he wanted to be Bayesian too. 
he defines a confidence interval as, as a Bayesian interval that has the right coverage no matter what prior distribution you use. So if you look in 1934, he defines it. In the appendix, he defines it in a Bayesian way. Um, and so the, the goal is to have of doing data analyses, I think, isn't really prediction. I think it's, it's understanding. And this is, is, is a comment that, that you can find in recent writing of David Cox, uh, which is kind of interesting. Because he said, the goal for doing it, it isn't to minimize mean square error or to get confidence coverage. It's to get, to generate understanding of, of, of what the underlying process is. That's kind of interesting to think about. And, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer that that's correct. It's kind of, you, you can't mathematically define it particularly well. Uh, important points here. The original motivation for any statistical procedure, whether Bayesian or, or machine learning based or the results of an amazing dream, is irrelevant to the frequentness operating characters. You can do this evaluation through, through simulation of any procedure, no matter where the procedure is. And, and that's kind of interesting because some people think because a, a, a procedure has a Bayesian motivation, it can't be valid. Which is ridiculous because that procedure has is a procedure, it has a life of its own. It doesn't matter where the idea came from. Uh, and that's why you can do these these frequentist evaluations, even machine learning algorithms, doesn't matter where they came from. And no matter what name you make up for it, it's deep learning, whatever it is, it, it, you can still evaluate. And for creating procedures, especially in complex situations, I think Bayesian models are often more generative. They generate ideas, generate ideas for procedures than standard and very limited frequency arguments, such as unbiasedness or minimum mean square or something else. And I think that's also kind of consistent with a lot of things in machine learning. Because you, the machine learning <coughs> guys are very creative at just making things up. They don't derive them as much as the statisticians do. They don't try to satisfy any property. They just think, well, here's a good idea. Let me see how well it works. At least that's my interpretation. Maybe unfair, but, uh, but yeah, that's the feeling that I get from, from reading like Tinturani test, previous test, and so on again. So Bayesian models are more often more generate ideas better. Uh, but evaluations, for example, calibrations of, of interval estimates are relevant because all models are wrong. So no matter what the Bayesian is doing, he's conditioning out something that's wrong. And who said that? Well, you know, George Box has this you know, famous quote, all models are wrong, but so are useful. Uh, he stole from von Neumann, who, who said that basically the same thing uh, 20 years before George ever did it. He said, like, the reality is far too complex for any, any mathematical representation. Yeah. And I, I basically do believe that as well. There are a couple of other interesting quotes, um, I, I think, that are related to machine learning and statistics. But here, here's one I went to. I wonder if you guys can guess who it is. Computers are worthless. They only give answers. Here's a hint, the initials. A genius, the guy who wrote that. And not, not like Van Norman, but BP, who, who did that be? Artist, Pablo Picasso. Picasso. <laughs> Picasso. <laughs> well, because what, what's, what's important isn't the computation that grinds out an answer. What's important are thinking, the ideas. Here's, a, here, here's another quote. It's, it's not exactly right, so the quote's actually kind of long. Computers are, and humans have something in common. Neither can think. <laughs> I think that, that, that's a great quote because I dislike the, the phrase machine learning. Machines don't learn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the end of it, they, they can't learn. You can write a program that they simulate learning. That's why artificial intelligence, I, I find that it doesn't work that much. So who said that? Neither can think. Van Neumann, that's right. He was a fairly smart guy, so he, he sort of understood that. So these are really important points to, to, to not forget that creativity, the brain, is, is still uh, much more interesting to me. So first to find uh, simple calibration. So how do you evaluate a proposed procedure called P uh, 
are going to be applied to a data set wide, which is yet to be collected. So you want a procedure, and now you're going to, so how are you going to evaluate, like you want to compare two, two different uh, procedures. And so for simplicity, suppose, just to get started, P is a 95% interval for, for a quantity Q, which is going to be the S demand, and we, we'll result from a particular survey. So we're, we're setting up a simulation where we're going to draw data sets Y repeatedly from some distribution, for example, and evaluate how well Q, how well this, uh, this how well P works to intimately estimate uh, Q. So Y is not yet observed. We're at the design stage. We know what the kind of design we This is a typical survey sample design. Right? You're getting a survey, you're going to, you're going to draw uh, a sample from a population, and you're going to apply a procedure, some procedure, whatever it is, and you're going to claim it's a 95%. Then I draw another sample and see whether the procedure, and calculate the procedure, and see whether it includes one. Let's keep doing it. Okay? Uh, so, and also for simplicity, assume that all experts agree on a set of K truths that could have generated the data one, and call the truths T1 through TK. And for each truth, there's a local estimate. For example, the, the mean of the distribution, something like that. Okay, so it's, it's, mean, it's, it's a common function of a function. So this is, a, this is a common setup. OK. And now I'm going to describe a hypothetical simulation to explicate. So each, each truth basically generates both the training sample and the training sample. Generate okay, data set, y, and I'm going to split it, for example, is with half into uh, training, half for testing. So how do I do these evaluations? So for each possible truth, I have this S demand, which is a function of, of the truth. And I'll generate J data sets using this design. So it's the simplest kind of simulation. And I'll apply this procedure, the same procedure, to each observed data set. This is the, uh, the truth, and that's the, the replications. And we'll see how often the estimate is, in the case truth, is covered by this procedure. So that's what I mean by calibration. That's basically everybody, I think, needs the same thing by calibration. Now we'll see, so again, we'll summarize the calibration by, by, by C, which is the, and, and for point estimates, uh, instead of just being the interval, including the value, it could be, you know, the uh, bias for Q or something like that. But I, I want to kind of talk about interval estimation that makes it, makes it simple. Okay. So, but hey, here's where I go. So each of these truths is a column, and this is the uh, estimate, the mean of, of, of the distribution, for example. And here are the J data sets being simulated. And here's the calibration. So it's the percentage of the, of the in this column, the percentage of, of the, when P is applied to the data is uh, estimated in the, in the So it's, there's a calibration for each. And you probably, it's, if, if you're uh, a statistician and, and familiar with the, the name and Pearson way of thinking, this is also obvious. There's, there's nothing new here except maybe just describing it in terms of the simulation. So C is the proportion of, of, of data sets where, where, the, where the S demand, the local S demand, is in the, in the interval. Okay. So how, how does name and say you should evaluate the situation? Well, a 95% interval estimate P is confidence calibrated for, for this truth if the calibration is greater or equal to 95%. So it's not exactly equal to 95%, but it, it's, it, it's conservative. So that's why I said at the start, it's kind of a, a silly idea because the whole real line is a 95% interval. It includes everything. But that's conservative. That's OK. It's also a 1% confidence interval. That's OK. So if, 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 if not, for those of you who haven't looked at this paper, it's kind of an amazing paper, wrote, written in 1934. One of the reasons why, the, why some of these stat papers are, are interesting is they often include discussion. And, and people in the discussions say what they really mean. 
the old days, at least they were very polite. And so Fisher was one of the discussants of this 34 main paper. At the time, they were still sort of friendly. Uh, and, uh, but Fisher did, didn't like this definition of confidence coverage exactly because it was conservative. And, and, and he thought that an interval estimate should have the right coverage, exactly the right, right, right coverage. And another mistake that, that Naaman made is Naaman said that his confidence intervals were the same as fiducial ones. He just said, no, you, you don't understand anything. Because a fiducial interval was supposed to be looking at a data set that got, had that coverage for that data set. Basically, this idea of fiducial intervals was rejecting hypotheses that didn't really weren't consistent with the data. Much more like Popper. You can reject models, but you can't accept it. So you rejected all values of, of the parameter that didn't generate data that looked like your data. I think it's a very important idea, and I'll, I'll uh, come back to it a little bit later. Okay, so, but, so Neyman's definition, and if so, if it's conservative for all truths, then it's called a confidence interval. So, and these these definitions are well defined, whatever the etiology, of the, whoever, however P got made up, however the procedure got, got, got made up, and that's why machine learning guys are happy to apply these evaluations because they still work for better where, where the procedure can be. But the point is, are they a positive? Are, are they appropriate after seeing a specific data set? Why? And that is, do they reflect a sage, a sage, a wise statistician's judgment about does this interval, I'm not going to call it a 95% interval, because it has this coverage over all these data sets that could have been generated, as, as at least that, that coverage. But are they, is it a, a wise state looking at this data set? I think you have to have a different attitude after seeing a data set. And that's, I think, what machine learners actually do all the time. So we're very, very close to that. Well, it's better to be nicely calibrated. That's close to 95 percent. That's that's our bottom. But why do I care about truths that are unlikely to be able to generate the observed data? So this is bringing in the fiducial argument. If I'm thinking about a truth in one of these these columns back here. Let's see. So if I'm thinking about but a truth, and I have a, data, a specific data set, and I look at the, and, and I look at here, and the and the truth can't generate data that looks like this data set. Why do I care about its calibration? Why do I care about how well some procedure works for a, a possible truth that has very low probability of being able to generate the observed data? And, and, and to formalize this, I think it helps to, to consider the uh, Bayesian perspective. But I'll probably skip the next slide except to say something about it. But the, the Bayesian posterior distribution can be uh, described using this uh, simulation. Because what you want to do is, first of all, the Bayesian has this problem that he has to have a prior, which is a weight on each of these possible truths, a prior weight, which is basically the same as the number of times you're going to draw from that truth in doing this simulation. How often, how much weight are you going to put on that truth? And when you, once you have actual observed data, Y star, then we focus on the parts of the previous simulation where the generated data matches this exactly. That's what meets the condition on, on data. So if you go back to the simulation again, you look at, you ignore all of these guys that don't exactly agree with the observed data. And if you don't know that's what a Bayesian does, that's what a Bayesian does. Because you're conditioning on the observed data exactly equal to your observed data. At the generated data exactly equal to your observed data. And so this, page, this description just says, OK, what you do is you look at the match rate for each column. So now, you know, what proportion of the generated data sets exactly match your data set? This proportion of generated data that exactly matches your data set. And then the posterior probability that the unknown estimate equals the estimate from like, um, equals the, the kth truth uh, is just given by this weighted weight by the 
right. And this is, is from uh, uh, an Annals of Statistics article that I wrote in 1984. Did this description of a Bayesian posterior distribution. And there's this guy who, who therefore attributes uh, approximate Bayesian computation, as you all know, to me. <laughs> Which is in Simon Tavari. In, in, yeah. He actually says that this is the first time it's written down. I, I guess maybe it is, but he, I wasn't doing it for that. that that, that was, I was using it as a description of what a basic posterior distribution is. But I guess that this has become almost a popular method. It seemed with back then in 84, it seemed no one could ever do it because it's so computationally ridiculously expensive. But computers have advanced. So with that, so the, the, there's two issues, maybe two complaints about this Bayesian view. One is how do you get rid of the prior? It's really kind of awkward to have a prior there. Where the hell did the prior come from? Um, and the second issue is you, in the, you place the equal sign in this definition of matching with some uh, approximately equal distribution in some sense. And it does it, does it, and I've had low dimensional sufficient statistics, that's easy. So if you join from the normal, all, you have, the, all these data sets have to match is the mean variance. Because that's sufficient statistics for, for normal. It's actually uh, interesting, though, because it, it, it relates this to I think this to something else. See, what are, like, how is, is a generated data set look like the observed data set? This look like is a kind of a deep idea. In fact, it's, it's related to one of the previous talks. On, on like, how, how the ideas like what's the dimensionality of the of the manifold for the real data and the manifolds for the generated data? It gets much closer to, to, to what we really have to think about. And not just the observed values and how they like squared loss or some silly thing like that. So in addition to uh, this calibration for each each truth, this MK, this matching proportion, is a proportion of matching data sets that can be generated by the data. So the truth really has a, has a calibration for the, for this procedure P, but then this has this match rate. How many data sets, what proportion of the data sets under this truth can, can, be, uh, uh, can be match the observed data set? So I, I, I really think that these calibration CK and the matching rate for the truth are relevant. So the condition, conditionally calibrated statistician starts the same place as, as Naomi Pearson does, but ignores results from all drawn data sets that do not match the observed data. Just ignore them, because that's a, a basin completely ignores it. Throws it out in all the conditions of the ones that exactly match. So basically, why should we care about hypothetical truths that are very unlikely to generate data that look like the observed data? And you, and you can see the, the mental intellectual conflict between Naaman and Fisher. Naaman wants his procedures that work in long run practice. Fisher's more of the scientist. He cares about an interest with this data set. Because you know, he was more, he's better known as a geneticist than he is as a statistician. He cared about science. And in science, you're looking at data sets. If you're looking at a data set, you want to get the right answer. And, and, and Fisher actually in his discussion says uh, explicitly, well, maybe if you're in manufacturing, you want to do quality control in manufacturing, sure, name is okay. It's, it's, Worry about long run practice. Not the science. It's not just the science. Uh, so you know, you, so basically, we summarize this result. This whole the results. This whole simulation by the calibration of the of, of this procedure for this truth k, with, with all, all the k. That seems the calibration. Does the interval, does this procedure cover the truth? And then the proportion of y k that are accepted for each truth. Can this truth generate data sets that look like my data set? So I want to, I want to only look at the parts of the simulation <coughs> for the truths, the possible truths that can generate the data set. Um, okay, and so the possible truths that with this matching percentage that are near one are more salient to my situation with particular data sets. Uh, basically, comparing procedures, which procedure to use with the data set Y, the conditionally calibrated statistician cares about both calibration and truth that match. Um, at the last point, it's not very important. 
So here we go back to the simulation and I'm saying, okay, here are data sets that match. I mean, ignore all the, all, all the data sets that don't match. Because they're more relevant to the observed data. And here's an example of a, of a plot, which is a sort of, sort of cute. It's so calibration is here, the matching is of the other different truths is here. So I've, I've now applied three different procedures. And what I'm pointing out about but the matching is the part of the simulation over here where the truths are generated data sets that look like my observed data set are the more relevant. I don't really care about what's going on over there. Because those, those possible truths can't generate data like that. Just as an extreme example, maybe some of these truths, for example, are, are normals with different means and variances. And some of the possible truths are quotients. And if I look at the data, and, and it can't be the quotient because it can't generate with, with, the, with the right gaps between the order statistics, I don't care. I don't care whether my procedure works well on the quotient or not, if the data obviously are not, are not quotient. And three procedures, well, Green is in it with a, with a happy face means that's conditionally calibrated. What, what's the condition? It's, it's a calibrated for truths that match my observed data, that can generate data. Here. The fact is that this procedure is lousy for data sets that can't generate data, data sets that look like out of here. Uh, red, it's not conditionally calibrated because. For, for truths that are possible, it's got less than 95%. So it's not calibrated where it, matter, where it matters. Now the yellow is kind of interesting. It's got coverage above 95% for all possible truths. But it doesn't do particularly well for, 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 for truths that I really care about. Why? Well, it's got over coverage. It's got, it's got 99%. And why do, I, why do I not like that? Well, if, if, a, if, a, if, a, if a interval of a procedure generates coverage like 100%, that means a, there must be a better procedure that has tight coverage, that has shorter intervals. So I, I, I probably don't, I don't like it for, for that reason. Well, I, so I think it's, it's, it's a useful way of th thinking about I care both about coverage, sure, but I only care about coverage for truths that are, that are plausible, given what I'm looking at. So calibration, initial kind of name of calibration fo formally focuses on the coverage across the entire table being greater than 95%. Bayesian just cares about the believed coverage for the column with these prior weights using the prior distribution. And it's conditionally calibrated status as she cares about calibration for truths with coverage rate uh, close to a nice calibration that was calibration close to 95 percent. So uh, the sage statistician is is uh, cal condition calibrated in sense. And how, how does this relate to the machine learning? Well, it's a trivial example relieving, uh, revealing my understanding or misunderstanding of this training testing test data set situation. But let's suppose we have a population with one variable, say male, male female, and where the estimate is the proportion of female in the population, we take one sample and find that Y is missing for 20%. And, and we, let's pretend that Y, is, and we know that's missing just completely at random, just dark throwing. We want to impute missing values to learn of, of the estimate from the proportion in the sample. So now I'm going to do my understanding, maybe completely naive, of, of machine learning. You randomly divide the full sample into a training sample and test sample. The training sample is a random half, the test sample is a random half. And I assume the missingness is missing completely at random. There's nothing going on at all, just dark from the data nature. So there's no reason to impute because I know what the correct answer is. But this, this example sort of reveals my, my confusion. So we estimate from the training sample the fraction female when Y is observed. Suppose it's a 60%. So the random half, 60%. And my two procedures, two methods for imputation, are everyone missing is female. Well, we know that's stupid. 
B, method B, man will be drawn, male and female with probability of 0.4. Male 0.4, female 0.6. So this is like understanding. But now I'm going to evaluate how well method A and B work in the test set. And, and, and by mean score error, which somebody wrote over there, or the hit rate getting the right answer, which is going to win? Which, right. A wins. So machine learning answer is completely stupid. I'm not saying it gets the wrong answer. If you're gambling, that's the right thing to do. If heads, if, 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 if black is going to come up with probability 0. 0.6 and red probability 0. 0.4, do I bet 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.4? No. Because if I, if I do that 0. 0.6, then I'll win only 52% of the time. So I'll only get, get the right prediction of male, female, 52% of the time. But if I say everybody's female, I'll get the right answer, 60%. And 60% is usually higher than 52%. So I, I, I guess I just don't understand machine learning. Because they, this, the, the evaluation, if it's based on hit rate, you know, the number right, or mean square error, or any simple loss function like that, it's wrong. It's wrong because it doesn't generate understanding. What I do understand is this re repeated sampling naming kind of evaluation, which makes sense, but I don't see it. Maybe I'm, I'm probably looking at it in the wrong places. So, uh, basically, uh, I, I guess I, I, I should be educated so, so that I, I, I understand what, what they're really, what machine learners are really trying to do. Because most of the stuff I look at, actually, I was at a conference in uh, Bordeaux. Uh, a couple of months ago, there was a machine learning uh, conference, and it, actually there was a lot of agreement that, you know, they, you know, we have to sort of build a loss function, they usually don't do it, and they use ROC curves or something. I mean, no, they, 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 they don't. They typically do this uh, training sample and test sample, and just evaluate how well procedures work in the test sample. But then you get the wrong answer as, as regarding uh, understanding, and uh, so I, 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 I think that, that that more thought should be given to what statistical evaluations you, you're using when you evaluate procedures this way. And I don't think the the, the simple uh, answer is, is the right one. So that's basically my point. There, there's some uh, invitation. Basic that well, this basic training testing paradigm I think is too too simple. I think you need to consider the purpose of data collection and the role of loss functions for aiding understanding. Understanding is a key word here. For general recommendations, I think you need to consider the hypothetical class of problems to be faced and the consequences of wrong decisions. And often I think the losses may be difficult to specify in advance because the world is often changing rapidly. And I think I'm thinking of the FDA context now, where if you, you know, drugs typically take decades to, to develop the starting in in vitro studies and then animal models and the, the, the human beings. And you, you, there's a lot of people out trying to make a billion dollars. And by the time you get your drug to, to, uh, to submit to the FDA, somebody else may have gotten it first. In some, in some sense. And, and so it's, it's difficult to specify losses correctly, loss functions correctly, in an advance of saying where the like, quote competition is in some sense. And I think visual displays. So hopefully, hopefully this, such as, as this picture, can be helpful. So I think the trade-offs between calibration and matching are relatively flexible and often change depending on what the context of the problem is. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. So, any questions? Oh, so in the beginning of the talk, you started with you know, all the experts has an agreement. So we have a K choose T1, uh, mm -hmm. uh, TK, so then we can do a discussion. But you are your problem. So uh, how to set up this agreement? It can also be a big problem. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah. Well, you know, in the survey sampling world, what, what these truths are, for example, are, are all uh, arrays of real numbers. So they, 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 the, the survey sampling guys, 
don't put any models down at all. Right, so it's just all real numbers. So that's what you're trying to get into uh, coverage. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of strange, but that, that, that was David's uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. That's what this, but it's called design based inputs. Mm -hmm. you, you have no model mm -hmm. on the data, they're just real numbers. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of that, but I think in, in most scientific contexts, the uh, the truth you do have some. I mean, whenever you, I mean, machine learning, you, you, you generate data from somewhere. Right? And, and, and one thing that's interesting about machine learning is they're often asked, acting as if the observed data are the only thing they care about. Mm -hmm. All they care about is, is data that exactly matches the observed data. That's why they split it into training and test. And how well <coughs> it works, if you can train it, and it works well on the test, you're done. Mm -hmm. That's what you should use. That's probably a caricature of, of machine learners, but when, when, when I look at, at, at articles and books, and, and in fact, I got very little pushback when I was in with front company machine learning. Okay, yeah, questions. I think that he's right. This is my engineer perspective. Mm -hmm. Where it's a procedure, you just want to sort of better do like gambling. It's really purpose yeah, is for right. gambling. And and, and if, if it works well on a data set that you have and you say, well, it's going to work well that, on similar that's, data That's why Google and Microsoft are pushing that, yeah. not, not at Harvard. Right. <laughs> yeah. And I can understand that perspective, but, it, it, but it, it, it's not designed to generate understanding. Actually, this recent article by, by uh, David Cox is one that I, 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 I'm the editorial board of uh, PMAS, the Seasons of National Academy of Science, and it was rejected, and, and David had it, it was arguing with, with, with the reviewers, that, that he was trying to describe a, pr a procedure that generated understanding. And, and one of the reviewers was you know, West Coast statistics, Peter Beckham and those guys. And they said, no, no, you have to prove math. Otherwise, it's, it's not worth uh, publishing the proceedings of the National Academy. It, it's wrong. <laughs> but basically, he's trying to, because in, in his article, Gabe was trying to talk about procedures that, it was, it was the uh, lasso kind of, kind of stuff where the lasso is designed to get one answer. And it optimizes something. And David's point was, well, you don't really care about one answer. What you really are after is like the class of answers that would give you about the same answer. It's the same understanding and, 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 the, and the same predictability. So you don't care about getting one that optimizes something. That's silly. But I think he's absolutely right. That you really want something. And the idea of instead of producing one answer, but uh, defining the class of answers that give you about the same uh, predictability is, 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 a, is a good view. One more question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, 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 one of the standard ways to think about constructing new theory is whether, and testing them, is whether they help explaining uh, new data. Uh, and but this seems to be contradicting of how you are thinking about things. I'm, I'm sorry, but I you, you so dropped your voice at the end of a couple of senses. Yeah, uh, sorry. So one of the ways uh, of thinking about constructing new theories is whether they help us explain uh, and predict on new data. Explain and predict are, are different things. Yeah. So uh, so I don't why. Well, it's here. How, how can you claim that you understood something if you if, if it doesn't help you predict on new data? No, that's exactly right. In fact, if you understand something, you'll be able to do good prediction, but you'll also be able to do the prediction for any loss function. That's what understanding means. No matter what loss function you put on, you're going to get a reasonable answer. Whereas prediction, at least as I understand the world of machine learning, focuses on like square loss. And that's the only thing they care about. Or hit rate for getting the right answer. At least when, when I'm looking, for example, a uh, preview picture on that. That's, that's what they seem to focus on. And I think that was one of, the, one of the points about the lasso. It's trying to get a one answer for something. And, and it can work well, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily generate understanding. I, I, I don't think we're going to say anything uh, uh, inconsistent. 
should I, should I think about it that say if I come up with a loss function which is uh, the if I trying to minimize the maximum loss would it be something closer to uh, uh, predicting for uh, in the that the, of loss uh, function? minimize the maximum loss overall loss functions overall procedure I mean, data set no, I, I see I think some, some of these things are are too hard to try to formalize mathematically to create one answer I think it's, it's often more interesting to, to create a, a class of answers because again the loss function is probably going to change in the real world Personally, in, in, in medical context. Okay, so thank you for being here. Thank you. So that concludes the session.